Good morning from the Harriman Institute at Columbia University here in New York City. My name is Tanya Domi and I am a professor teaching in our Balkan Studies program at the Harriman Institute. The Harriman Institute at Columbia University is one of the world's leading academic institutions devoted to Russian, Eurasian and East European studies. Our mission is to serve our community at the university and beyond by supporting research, instruction, and dialogue, sponsoring vibrant and multidisciplinary events that bring together our extraordinary resources of faculty, students, and alumni. We are committed to training the next generation of regional specialists to play leadership roles in setting the academic and scholarly agenda, making policy and challenging accepted truths about how we study our rapidly changing world. I am personally de delighted and honored to in introduce our speaker today. We Welcome Catherine Bomberger, the Director General of the International Commission for Missing Persons to the Institute. She has worked in the field of international relations, human rights, politics, and conflict prevention for the last 20 years. Since 1998, she has led the development of the ICMP, which is today the world's leading human rights and rule of law organization dedicated exclusively to helping governments address missing persons issues arising from war, human rights violations, migration, organized crime, natural disasters, and other causes. She was appointed the ICMT Director General in 2004. Since its creation in 1996, ICMP has been transformed from an ad hoc mechanism tasked with assisting countries emerging from conflicts in the former Yugoslavia to a treaty-based international organization with global reach. Catherine Bomberger has consistently sought to ensure that the global challenge of missing persons is addressed by governments as an urgent priority in a manner that is modern, effective, and based on the rule of law. As the only international organization that is exclusively tasked to address this issue, ICMP actively engaged in developing institutions and in civil society capacity, promoting legislation, fostering social and political advocacy, and developing and providing technical expertise to locate and identify the missing. It is noteworthy to recognize that today is in fact the Right to Truth Day, and ICMP is emphasizing this, pr these principles on its social media channels. And in particular, the Paris principle number six, all families of all missing persons have a right to know the truth about the circumstances of disappearances of their relatives and in fatal cases, the cause and manner of death. Before I turn the microphone over to Catherine, I want to recognize her for her exemplary, exemplary service over many, many years in her leadership role at the ICMP. It is remarkable to think and to note that I met Catherine in Focha, Bosnia and Herzegovina 25 years ago when both of us were in the OSCE mission and posted to Eastern Bosnia. The microphone is now yours, Catherine. Thank you very much, Tanya. And it's a great honor to be here. Um, and you are an amazing person. So and what you've done in all the years. And actually, we first met, met in Haiti, actually, even before Focha. Yeah, see, you forgot. I, I forgot. Yeah. Anyway. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's a long, long time ago. We don't even want to talk about how long <laughs> right, ago it was. Right. But, but it's a great honor to be here. And thank you very, very much for inviting me and really for highlighting this issue, which is so important, not only for ICMP, but for the world, as I'll explain. So I think the first thing I'm going to do here is Carly's going to share my PowerPoint presentation. I hope all of you can see it. Uh, that is the title here, why has this important issue, human rights issue been sidelined? What I'd first like to do, 
think, hold on, I've got to take control here, is show you the first slide. It doesn't seem to be working, Carly. Um, hmm. There we go. Oh, did oh, I want yes. to Yeah, there we go. Uh, this, this first slide, I just wanted to highlight this particular picture uh, because I think it's emblematic of the issue of missing and disappeared persons. This is a photograph that was taken probably in 2011 in Libya. Um, and that shows a, a woman who's obviously missing her, her son, probably from the conflict that took place in Libya in 2011. Um, and she's seeking answers uh, regarding her missing son. Um, she appears to be rather begging for answers regarding her missing son, rather than being in a position to demand answers. And I think this picture is evocative of the issue in general. Uh, the majority of those who go missing from armed conflict and other causes are in fact men, meaning women are left behind as survivors now uh, to find their missing relatives um, and to do so in a manner that uh, hopefully adheres to their rights. However, many of them are not aware of their rights and this, this presentation will demonstrate uh, the extent to which these rights are being ignored or sidelined. Um, also, you'll see that she's a bit afraid. Um, I'm sure, well, she should be. Um, she's surrounded by a number of men um, with weapons. Um, so being able to come forward and to demand answers regarding a missing person is not an easy feat. Going into the next slide. For some reason, I'm not have, I don't have control. Sorry, Carly, if you could help. Um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've tried re-sharing it. It says the waiting for you to control the screen. So I don't know if you need to accept it. Um, but if not, I can just change the slides okay, for you. If you don't mind, Carly, yeah. Um, sorry, sorry, everyone. Thank you. So just going into a bit of the circumstances, I think it's very important for people to understand what are the circumstances under which persons go missing. Um, many of you may be aware of the Convention on the Protection of Persons from Enforced Disappearance, uh, and I'll talk about that later, um, but being forcibly disappeared is not the only set of circumstances under which persons go missing. Um, there are untold millions of people missing around the world from various wars, both current conflicts and historical conflicts. Um, persons go missing as a consequence of human rights abuses, of course, including the category of being enfor of enforced disappearance where states or others acting on the behalf of states abduct people, execute them, um, and hide their bodies. Uh, this is a classic case of enforced disappearance. Um, there are other cases of missing persons where persons go missing from organized violence, from human trafficking, human slavery. People are also missing from disasters, including man-made and natural disasters. And of course, there's an increase in the number of natural disasters linked to global warming. Um, we can see now the California wildfires, the same thing happening in Australia, uh, you know, floods that are occurring with more frequency, tornadoes, hurricanes. Uh, persons also go missing from these factors. And they also go missing from migration. Um, and of course, if you look at all these events under which persons go missing and see global warming as a contributing factor in this regard, you can see that these cases are linked. So Carly, if you could go to the next slide, please. So, but who are the missing? Um, because I'm trying to paint the picture of why this issue is so marginalized or sidelined as a human rights issue, we have to understand who the missing are, what are the demographics behind this issue? As I noted with the first slide, the majority of missing are actually men. Um, we know this for a fact, for example, in the context of the Western Balkans where ICMP started its work in 1996, um, we were able to use eventually DNA technologies uh, to provide irrefutable evidence of a person's identity, which could then uh, not only be, uh, help families of the missing uh, find their missing relatives, but also could use, be used to, uh, for criminal trial purposes to provide evidence to hold perpetrators to account. But in the case of the Western Balkans, we know for a fact uh, that 90% of those missing were men. Uh, which means that clearly a majority of the survivors are women. Also, a majority of the missing um, in a modern sense are civilians. If you, if you compare uh, conflicts uh, from World War I, or if you pair, compare the conflict of World War I to, let's say, the former Yugoslavia, um, the number of casualties um, included um, combatants at a ratio of seven to one to civilians. 
In the context of the former Yugoslavia, that ratio is turned on its head, where in fact uh, the number of civilians who died in that conflict um, were 10 to 1 uh, compared to combatants. Also, the majority of the are the poor minorities. And if we look at si the situation in the West, for example, uh, there's discrimination in the cr criminal ju judicial system, which results in a higher number of unresolved cases relevant to uh, indigenous communities or black communities or other minorities. And also increasingly, and I think this has come onto everyone's agenda, there are a large number of missing migrants. Of the 7 billion people um, on the planet Earth, or plus 7 billion, a large number of those individuals are on the move. And many of them go missing as they travel between countries. Uh, uh, next slide, please, Carly. So who are the survivors? If the majority of, of the missing are men, it's women who are the large majority of survivors. Um, and I do believe, quite frankly, that one of the issues or one of the reasons this issue has been a silent issue for so long, and if you look at that picture I showed earlier of the woman in Libya, is because women have been marginalized or they have been afraid to come forward uh, for fear of reprisals to demand answers regarding their missing loved ones. Um, I think that is really clearly uh, an issue in this regard. Um, but it's, it's, that's not to say that uh, women aren't disappeared themselves or targeted. Um, there are cases, obviously, and most famously, Daesh crimes committed against Yazidi populations, which targeted primarily women, or cases in Mexico, Canada, or the famous cases of the girls uh, a part of, uh, that were disappeared by Boko Haram. Um, and there are probably cases that are unreported. We know this for a fact in the context of uh, Iraq and Syria, for example, where there's shame in reporting missing uh, women who've gone missing. Carly, next slide, please. I wanted to, I just wanted to say one thing, the, the numbers are now on the rise in the world. And I wanted to highlight one particular region. I know this is a very sophisticated audience. We wanna look at this globally, but I thought I would appeal for a moment to your own self-interest and look for a moment at Western countries. I don't think many of you realize uh, that in the context of Europe right now, there are over 20,000 dead and missing migrants since 2013. Um, this is really a sad testament. I mean, this the picture I have in front of you is a picture of the island of Lampedusa in Italy. Uh, there are migrants coming from 85 different countries into the central Mediterranean who have gone onto boats that are or ships that are not worthy of uh, you know, being in the Mediterranean and have died. And in fact, many people have referred to the Mediterranean now as a mass grave. So these numbers are on the rise. Next slide, please. Carly. And if you look also at Europe, um, not only are there large numbers of missing migrants, but the region itself or the neighborhood region of Europe is surrounded by conflicts. There's Syria, where today there are over 100,000 missing persons from this conflict that does not end. Um, and they're not only missing from the current conflict, but they're also missing as a consequence of the regime of Hafez al-Assad. They're also missing from migration um, into Europe from human trafficking, child trafficking. Um, it's a very complicated issue. And I think the Syrian context really highlights why this issue is so complicated and why we can't create divisions between the, the circumstances under which persons go missing because they're missing from conflict, human rights abuses, they're missing from maritime disasters and they're missing from migration. So one Syrian can be missing from, I mean, the Syrians of the 100,000 that are missing can be missing from multiple circumstances. Uh, Libya has quite a number of missing persons, um, also from the period of Gaddafi's rule uh, with wars with Chad and Egypt, but also from the conflict of 2011, the conflict that started again in 2014. And of course, a high number of missing migrants. Ukraine also um, has high numbers of missing persons. We don't know how many. And of course, Nagorno-Karabakh, which experienced a conflict again at the end of this year. And in both Libya and Azerbaijan, there are also Syrian mercenaries who've gone missing. So if you look at this region as a whole, uh, you'll see that in order to find missing persons, there's a, there's a connectivity between all these circumstances, between missing migrants 
and these cases of conflict that are surrounding this region. So trying to account for those missing requires intergovernmental cooperation. In a modern day, in, in, in the world today, when it comes to missing persons, we cannot look at this as a single domestic issue. It's an international issue that requires cooperation between states. Uh, next slide, please, Carly, thank you. And in, the, uh, in North America, um, of course, we're all very familiar, I hope, with the issue of the children that have been separated, the migrant children that have been separated from their families, um, but also there are quite a high number of missing migrants as well along the US-Mexico border. Um, Biden recently created a task force, thankfully, uh, that's an intergovernmental task force uh, that includes the State Department, Homeland Security, and Health and Human Services hopefully to try to reunite these families. I've included a package of material that I've sent to Tanya, by the way, which you can look at. And, and one of the um, documents I've shared with Tanya uh, is a document that we put together about how this issue can be resolved. It's going to be complicated. Um, obviously the relatives that are related to these migrant children should have a choice regarding who they provide their data to, including genetic data to be able to uh, confirm family relationships. Uh, so many of them may not want to give their data to the United States. So this is something that we're exploring now with another group, 545, uh, which includes quite a number of universities. As I noted early, earlier, also there's discrimination um, uh, you know, within the criminal ju justice system, which results in a higher number of unresolved cases. And of course, there's global warming, which contributes to um, disasters. Uh, next slide, Carly. But who's responsible then for finding the missing? Um, and when I was talking to Tanya earlier, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it, this is a state responsibility. Um, and this is confirmed under international law. I provided examples of, of laws that exist. Of course, I've talked about the International Convention on the Protection of Persons for Enforced Disappearance earlier. It's a fantastic convention. It's in force in the world today. ICMP works with governments to try to ensure that they um, sign the convention. But, but the convention does not apply to all missing persons cases, to just one category. We've issued as ICMP a set of principles, and of course our ICMP agreement or the ICMP treaty, uh, which came into force in 2015, embraces all missing persons cases. So it's important that these same principles that are enshrined within the convention regarding state responsibility apply to all missing persons cases, not just those cases uh, where persons were forcibly disappeared, but also to cases regarding missing migrants and minority groups. Next slide, please, Carly. The underlying principles that are in our Paris principles, and we call them the Paris principles because we launched this at the Paris Peace Forum in 2018, are listed here. I won't go over them now in the interest of time, and I'll, I'll leave this PowerPoint um, with uh, Tanya. But I think, of course, these underscore state responsibility, uh, the need for states to investigate missing persons cases in line with the rule of law. Next slide, Carly. So why is this issue sidelined as a human rights issue? Um, I think you can begin to get an inkling of what's happening here. Uh, first of all, even though this issue is as old as mankind, it hasn't really fully been embraced or understood to be a state responsibility yet. So if we're looking, for example, at the case of missing migrants in the context of Europe, where there are over 20,000 missing migrants um, currently, it's very important that the same principles of investigation are, implied, uh, are applied to citizens and non-citizens. Otherwise, we undermine the rule of law and we undermine our democracies. Also, the issue is not universally understood to be a human rights and rule of law issue. In fact, the issue is often relegated as a humanitarian concern. And if you look at the United States or Europe, um, in the United States, uh, there are state institutions that came now with the Biden task force, you know, the, the government hopefully is taking responsibility. But before the establishment of the Biden task force, a lot of the efforts to find missing migrants were relegated to NGOs or to universities. Um, I mean, this is not something that can be outsourced. This is a state responsibility. And the same thing with Europe. Um, it's been left to the Red Cross or to the Vatican uh, to help find missing persons. Uh, but these do not constitute investigations into missing persons cases. 
Often also there is a lack of political will. This goes without saying. I mean, all of you from the Western Balkans will know this well or from other areas emerging from conflict. I mean, obviously if states were responsible for disappearing people, they're not interested in finding them because they're covering up crimes. Um, but also the survivors, and again, think about the picture I showed at the beginning of the, the woman in Libya. They're primarily women, minorities, migrants, refugees, displaced persons. And there are others that are not listened to and who may not be aware of their rights. Some other examples, and I think I, I clearly uh, went over those in the previous slide. Uh, next slide, please, Carly. So ultimately what's emerging here as the issue of missing persons has been sidelined uh, as a human rights issue is we're creating a double standard, which I've alluded to earlier in the context of the West in particular. Um, because it's not universally understood to be a human rights issue. Um, and as I've said earlier, West, in Western countries, citizens, if, you're, if you're a white male German, um, Germany, and you go missing, Germany is going to investigate your disappearance. Um, same thing in the United States. However, if you belong to a minority group or you're a non-citizen, a different modus operandi exists where persons may not be not only not investigated in, in terms of their disappearance, um, but they may be subjected to a process that is just trying to trace them or trying to um, reunite families, which is not does not constitute a proper investigation. Next slide, please. Carly, sorry. Uh, the same goes for countries emerging from conflict. Um, and of course, this, this, uh, the humanitarian practice of tracing, which is led by NGOs or humanitarian organizations, is not sufficient. And in the world today, you'll see that with the majority of countries emerging from conflict, that the Western Balkans, which we can talk about later, emerges as an unpre unprecedented situation where um, over 70% of the 40,000 people who went missing including almost 90% of those missing from the Srebrenica genocide, uh, these cases were investigated by states. And I see Sergio Olympievich is here in the audience, as he knows in the context of Serbia, also um, when it came to the Kosovo conflict, it was a district court of Belgrade that led investigations into Batanica, Petrovoselo, and Banja Bashta, uh, which is a very important point. So, I mean, this principle of ensuring that the state um, conducts proper investigations into missing persons cases and secures the rights of surviving families of missing is critical. And ICMP has provided evidence in 30 criminal trials uh, regarding um, the cases that it worked on in the context of the Western and Balkans. So this principle, which is largely embraced by the, the West, except in cases, of course, as I said, where uh, uh, non-citizens go missing, migrants or minorities, where a lot of work needs to be done. But this principle of proper investigation, which is upheld under international law, must be adhered to by all states. Next slide, please, Carly. And I'm just reaffirming that here. So the way forward would be to end this double standard, uh, to apply one standard that's in line with the rule of law and human rights, to enforce state responsibility, and to investigate all missing persons, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or national background, or the circumstances of their disappearance, and to secure the human rights of all survivors to justice, truth, and reparations. And reparations is a key issue here. I've not seen one country get this right. Unfortunately, what tends to happen is that female survivors can claim benefits based on the circumstances of their, the, the men that went missing. So this cannot continue. They should be able to claim reparations or compensation based on a universal principle that should apply to all. Obviously, another thing that needs to happen is to increase awareness among survivor groups, especially these marginalized groups that I talked about earlier, so that they understand their rights and they understand that they can claim their human rights. Obviously, justice mechanisms need to be strengthened, both in the international and domestic setting and international capacities uh, need to exist that can help countries, um, whether they're rich or poor. 
The next slide, please. Yeah, this is the, uh, now I'm just opening. I mean, I'll hand over to you, Tanya. Um, I just thought I would have this slide open as cases where uh, for the most part, uh, states engage in a process of investigations in line with the rule of law. Um, in the case of the Southeast Asian tsunami, it was the first time in history that the poli police forces came together to look for missing persons from a natural disaster. So I just wanted to highlight that, that even though it was a disaster, um, it was police forces. So you're moving effectively through time where a long time ago, these efforts were quite ad hoc. We have the Geneva Conventions uh, emerging where you know, the laws of war uh, and sharing information uh, between warring parties becomes relevant uh, ensure, and ensuring prevention of persons missing during armed conflict. But this presentation has been dedicated to what states do following on armed conflict and when prevention fails, what are states' obligations? On that note, I'd hand over to you, Tanya. Thank you very much. Um, you and I were talking before um, today uh, about, about your experience and what was accomplished uh, in the Western Balkans. Would you share that with our audience? Because not everyone would know the extent of, of what took place. It was the, the commission was initiated by then President Bill Clinton and um, he funded and helped support the beginning of the ICMP. It, yeah, and it was an interesting period of time because I think the 1990s, I mean, ICMP was created in 1996, as you said, at the behest of President Clinton at a G7 summit. Um, right before that, 1993, uh, the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia was created, its counterpart for Rwanda, the ICC in 1998. So the 1990s were a big period for ensuring uh, rule of law procedures um, were met in the international community and that perpetrators were held to account. So our mandate at that time um, to ensure the cooperation of governments was quite uh, new, <laughs> quite profound, I right. think. So um, a lot of architecture, that a lot of architecture. Exactly, so that's the architecture. Yes. Exactly, so what we did initially, um, each warring party at that point was searching for its own missing persons cases, which is not only uh, not in line with human rights norms, but also would not result in finding a large number of missing persons. In the slide that was, I had presented earlier, uh, that slide represents the 2005 signing of the Missing Persons Institution Agreement. So the creation of a Missing Persons Institute in Bosnia allowed for Bosnia-Herzegovina to cert to investigate missing persons cases regardless of the ethnic, religious, or national origin of the missing person. So laying that foundation was critical. Also, there was a law established by Bosnia-Herzegovina in 2004 uh, that also upheld the same principles. Finally, the use of DNA technologies, you know, with this architecture present, um, allowed, I mean, and we, we were the first to harness this, this new technology um, in 1999 and apply it broadly now to the case of 40,000 people, um, provided irrefutable evidence of a person's identity. So effectively, what, what's happened all these years later is that of the 40,000 people who went missing, over 70% have been accounted for and almost 90% of those missing from Srebrenica. And many of these cases have, have gone to um, uh, court uh, and been presented as evidence for criminal trial purposes. So this is, an, this is an unprecedented number of missing persons has been accounted for. And that model should serve as a model for all states, including for Syria in the future, for Colombia today and many other countries in the world. Thank you. Um... We have a question on Latin America from a audience member and I'll read it to you, um, Catherine. Latin America, Latin America in particular, Colombia established a few years ago, the unit for the searching of missing persons in the context of the armed conflict. Some have also raised the alarm on Venezuelan migrants, including children who might be going missing uh, at the border, ICMP established an office in Colombia some time ago. What have you observed there so far? Could you please tell us more about your work in Colombia? No, thank you very much for that question. I mean, Colombia, as you, yes, the, the peace agreement was signed in 2016, uh, which created the search unit among other um, institutions of peace. 
Um, Colombia has all the ingredients it takes to be able to address this issue. The numbers are high, uh, but between the HEP, between the search unit, uh, between the Tr Truth Commission, um, there is, I think, the institutional capacity um, and, and with the legislation in Colombia, you know, first piece of legislation established in 1991, second in 2005, um, at Colombia has all the ingredients to be able to account for missing persons. Plus, Colombia has a vibrant and amazing, um, diverse civil society that is actively engaged in this issue. So we're hoping that the work of the search unit um, will result, which has a 20 year mandate, um, and they're a little bit into that mandate at this point, will result in finding persons missing from the 50 year conflict. Your point regarding Venezuela is very important because the mandate of the search unit um, is limited to, and that's not bad because the numbers are significant, finding persons from the 50 year conflict. It does not include, however, uh, finding potential missing migrants who may be coming in from Venezuela. So how to do this um, will become complicated, but there are other institutions, and this is the issue with, I would say, just to be a little bit constructively critical of the current situation, um, there are a plethora of institutions in Colombia whose work needs to be harmonized. So the search unit must work in harmony, not only with the HEP, but also with the Fiscalia, also with the Medical Legal Institute and the other institutions that existed prior to the um, uh, 2016 peace agreement. And in that way, it would be possible, I think, through cooperation between these various institutions to find all missing persons, regardless of the category they went missing under. I'm going to um, invite Velma Sadich, uh, who's the founder and president of the Post-Conflict Research Center based in Sarajevo. Uh, I'm inviting her to ask a question. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you so much for allowing me to say a few words. So first of all, I would like to say thank you to Harman Institute and you and Carly for uh, organizing this event. And I want to also recognize the, the work of ICMP under Catherine's leadership through all these years. We have been working closely last 10 years, as long as I'm running post conflict Research Center, but I also did work 10 previous years. So I literally following the work for 20 years. We cannot summarize, and I don't want to like take too much time on summarizing the recognition, but it has been enormous in, in a field of missing people, in legal procedures, as like Catherine mentioned, also creating the databases and a lot of, lot of um, informations which we are able to use in our educational curriculums when we are struggling with three different narratives. So this is also for us who do work in, a, in peace building is enormous. So. Yeah, I want to ask because I'm thinking uh, about these international portfolios and everything what Catherine mentioned that they are doing now and the work with the migrants. Can she maybe uh, tell us few lessons or good practices or, 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 or something what have been learned, especially from Bosnia? We heard about DNA method and some of these, but is there anything special carrying from, from BIH? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Velma. It's great to see you. There are lots of lessons learned from Bosnia because we, I mean, as an organization, we work hand in hand with Bosnia, with uh, Croatia, with Serbia, with uh, Kosovo, with all the countries in the region, with the families of the missing, with people like you and institutions like yours. Uh, so this was not, and of course, with the you know international community. Uh, to this is a huge undertaking um, that resulted in finding such a high number of missing persons. So, I mean, number one, having an ICTY was critical. You know, I mean, I, you know, right now Iraq has UNITAD, Syria has a triple AM. They're using you know universal justice mechanisms to take cases to court. But having an ICTY was critical to upholding the rule of law and ensuring that proper investigations took place. And, and also helping propel a domestic process where prosecutors took the lead also um, in investigating missing persons cases. Number two, having an institution, um, whether it's the Missing Persons Institute in Bosnia or whether it's the commissions on missing persons in Kosovo, Serbia, and Croatia, um, and now having those institutions work together at a regional level where there's a missing persons group is essential. So intergovernmental cooperation is key because the conflict did not respect borders, obviously. So persons missing who were originally from Bosnia may have been found in Croatia or Serbia and vice versa. 
Um, I mean, many Serbians have found these, for example, many, many Serbians are missing, sorry, were found in Serbia, for example. So having intergovernmental cooperation between states is key. Secondly, um, having, you mentioned the database, this database is gold. Um, the only way to ensure proper chain of custody because, and, and to be able to pro provide evidence at a level that we were able to do so uh, with the ICTY require, re required ensuring that every single step of the missing persons process was documented. Um, so from the collection of data from families of the missing where we hold data, uh, on the behalf of families of the missing with their permission to use for the purpose of um, locating their relatives and identifying them and also to share with third parties with their permission. Famously, in the case of Srebrenica, we did this um, with Karadzic himself, another long story. Um, also information regarding um, the mass graves themselves. So all of the mass graves uh, that we were present at um, all of that data is uploaded into the data system so that every, and including our DNA laboratory system, so that every single component of the missing persons process of the 40, you know, of the thousands of people that were identified is stored in a single database, um, which can be shared with the governments and shared with families of the missing, which result in being able to do something like we did in Srebrenica. I mean, Srebrenica is the most difficult case ever. I mean, obviously it's a genocide, the perpetrators went back to the original mass grave sites, dug up the bodies, removed them to multiple secondary sites. Um, this instigated ICMP's use of DNA because there was no other way to identify the victims. Um, and being able to have a single database allowed us to work um, with the, the authorities uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, including the prosecutor's office and the Missing Persons Institute to piece the bodies back together again. Um, I mean, in, in the average case in Srebrenica, uh, the average man would be found in multiple locations, up to 14 different locations, uh, because the bodies were so heavily disarticulated from being removed by heavy machinery from one location to another. So having a centralized database um, is absolutely essential to having chain of custody where you can link the identity of the person back to the crime scene. We have an email from uh, an observer um, who identifies himself as an aircraft and MIA recovery expert um, with the ICAT blue team. I don't know if that means anything to you. Um, he, his uh, question is, I'm assuming it's a man by his name, Evander uh, Boke, Brokeman. Uh, is there any focus by the EU on the missing migrants at EU coastlines? Um, there is, but for the moment, I would say, I mean, we've been working a lot with Malta, Greece, Italy, and Cyprus uh, to try to ensure their cooperation in finding missing persons. Um, this will be key. In, tw in 2018 in Rome, we actually launched what is called a joint process on missing migrants. Um, and this is important because families can be separated. So for example, there's a very famous case where one Syrian family, um, husband, wife, uh, and two children uh, made it alive to Italy on a boat. Um, as soon as they arrived in Italy, the family was separated. And the, and the father has on his iPhone taped his two children being taken away on a speedboat across the Mediterranean where he never saw them again. So presumably there will be cases where families were separated, children may be found in one location, parents in another. Um, and for a million and one reasons, it's extremely important that these states cooperate. That's number one. Number two, Given, now, uh, given that this issue now constitutes the highest number of missing persons in Europe since World War II or the Balkans conflicts, Europe is not set up to deal with such a high number of, I mean, we're dealing with a highly abnormal set of circumstances. And this requires an infrastructure, just like building the Missing Persons Institute in Bosnia-Herzegovina or creation, creating these commissions in the regional states. It's important that there are institutions within these states that are tasked to deal with these issues because one state, it's a cross cutting issue. So you'll find that the maritime forces are dealing with these issues, the police are dealing with this issue, universities. So having one focal point, for example, Malta created a task force. So these measures, again, institutional, 
cooperation are key. Um, then a centralized data system is going to be absolutely essential to finding missing migrants. If they're coming from 85 different countries, they're missing in the Mediterranean. Some of them are living now, have made it to Europe and are living in Europe. This will require being able to put together a centralized database that may include, for example, data of living and dead persons who are missing in Europe and including within that data, uh, data coming from individuals living in the country of origin, for example, the Horn of Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is a big undertaking, but it's not impossible. Um, but so far we have this joint process. We're hoping that this joint process will extend to the Western Mediterranean and that we can create a shared data system capability between them. Um, I just want our audience to know in case you didn't hear Catherine say that the, that the ICMP is working with the Biden Joint Task Force to identify missing not children. Yet. Not yet, we're, we're hoping to work. We're, we're hoping, hoping to work. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun. No, don't That's worry. A, it's totally Freudian because I want it to happen. Um, yeah. Okay, um, I, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm actually- There's a question about Syria. Yeah, there's a question, there's a question for you about Syria. Nowadays in countries like Syria, are the governments accepting uh, the help from ICMP, or is it difficult for your inner, your multidisciplinary team to be successful there? Yeah, no, I, and this year, um, Syria sadly is commemorating 10 years of bloody conflict, um, and this war must end. Um, it's, it's, it's impossible to find 100,000 people while there's a an ongoing conflict like this. Um, and of course, there's zero political will on the current uh, administration or current regime, on the Assad regime, who is in the pr process of disappearing people at the moment. So finding missing people under these circumstances uh, is impossible. We have a Syria program. What we're trying to do now is to lay the groundwork for a future process. And here Velma's question again becomes important. So we're working directly with Syrian civil society, um, trying to unite them because again, they're, they're very fractured like often civil society is, but you know, often they will also come together in, on this issue because it's in their self-interest to do so. Uh, but to bring them together on common policy issues. And one important one is creating the centralized data system capability ICMP has privileges and immunities here in The Hague. We can hold data legally, um, which means when we hold, receive data directly from families of the missing, um, we can protect that data and we will not share that data with any third party without their permission. But taking that data, as we did in the Western Balkans, we coll collected data from 100,000 families of the missing living in the region of the Western Balkans, living in North America, living in Western Europe, living in Australia, living in all the places where uh, Bosnians and others became refugees, Serbians, Croatians, everybody became refugees. And having that data was critical. That also puts families in the driver's seat. So the more we can do with civil society now to empower them, to teach them about their rights, uh, to unite them, to create the centralized data system capability, uh, the better placed Syria will be to be able to tackle, tackle this issue, hopefully once this conflict ends. So now I'm going to ask uh, Edith Seffer, who is an American, a Bosnian American. She originated from Basanski Novi in BIH. She is the uh, current president of the Bosnian Genocide Institute, and she's very active in diaspora uh, work here in the United States. So Ida, we uh, welcome you to ask a question. Thank you, Tanya, um, and, and thank you, Catherine. Um, I've been following your work for a long time, um, <laughs> and I'm uh, eternally grateful for all the effort that you put in and the really difficult um, stuff is the best way I could put it. The, the stuff you have to deal with, the, the stories, the, the obviously um, uh, figuring out a way to comfort uh, survivors and, and all of that. Um, I'm actually curious, you mentioned um, a case for reparations. 
And I'm actually curious um, if you could el elaborate a little bit on that. What would be your best case scenario that you could envision um, for like a state to take this on as, as a way to support survivors? No, thank you, Ida. And that's nice to meet you. I um, hope to meet you in person one day. Uh, if, if there is a, a law on missing persons in Bosnia-Herzegovina, the law has not been fully implemented. There are two items um, in the law um, that have now not, I mean, that we're still hoping Bosnia will fully implement. One is the central record, because while we have, as, as Velma noted, we have the centralized data system capability, but Bosnia also has a central record. So all states should have a central record of everyone that went missing. Um, and they're getting closer. Bosnia is getting closer to doing this. The law also calls for a fund for families of the missing. Um, and here I really have to give credit to, God, I can't remember her name, she, used to, she worked within the Ministry for Human Rights who led a discussion on the creation of this law. Um, what's foreseen in this fund is that families of the missing would be able to access reparations regardless of the circumstances of the disappeared person. Uh, because currently in Bosnia-Herzegovina, if you are a Srebrenica survivor, you receive compensation as Shahid, as a martyr. If you are a Bosnian Serb survivor, uh, you receive compensation as the family of a veteran. So again, you know, your status in terms of receiving reparations depends on the circumstances of the disappearance. So it's hardly, highly compartmentalized. What would be preferable is a situation where there's just you know, a fund for all families of the missing to receive equal compensation um, following conflict. Uh, that is difficult, but it's an investment in peace and stability. I mean, all these factors have to be seen as a longer term investment into peace and stability. So I think in Croatia also, if you are part of the union of family members, um, you receive compensation, but if you're part, if uh, you know, if it's it's a Croatian Serb family, they don't, they cannot be part of the union. So. If in the Middle East at the moment, in Iraq or Libya, uh, you receive compensation if you're the family of a martyr. Uh, but what happens if you're not? So I think, again, you know, this, this adds a political quality to the issue, which is what you're trying to end, because that's what, uh, that's what resulted in them, in them disappearing in the first place. So continuing to politicize this issue through how you compensate the surviving families of the missing, particularly women, um, is doing them a disservice. So uh, what needs to happen is that uh, these cases, I mean, you know, that these rights are afforded to all, regardless of the circumstances of the disappearance of the person and regardless of the ethnic, religious or national origin of, of that person and the surviving family. And, and when you um, also think about the situation of all survivors, because all survivors suffer in some way, whether it's psychological or if it's material or if it's physical. Um, you know, this is a this is a subject that I really went deep into it with respect to my thesis uh, about wholesale trauma in Bosnia and Herzegovina and how it probably prevents people from fully participating in its life and and its politics and yeah. uh, as a citizen and one that should be somehow recognized and and um, you know whether it's symbolic if it's a small amount there should be some form of what you're discussing what you're suggesting is universe universal reparations for suffering and we know many many there isn't a person that hasn't really suffered in some way many have suffered more depending on their circumstances for sure right no, absolutely. And, and you can see, I mean, as I was saying in Iraq, I mean, what I think, you know, one of the more horrible circumstances is, or if, even in Syria, um, again, because this has to do with, you know, claiming rights, for example, inheritance rights. Uh, and, and this happened in, in Bosnia as well, um, and other areas of the former Yugoslavia. Um, to claim inheritance rights, in many cases, fam women had to prove or families had to prove uh, that the person was dead. And of course, they didn't want to say that because the person they didn't know. I mean, there's this is the horrible thing about right. missing the persons. emotional it's, aspects it's, of that. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's recognized as a form of mental torture. Um, right. In fact, and for states to withhold that information is a form of mental torture. But it also has real life uh, application in addition to the mental suffering 
there are also rights uh, that can't be claimed. Um, so custody, for example. So, I mean, what Bosnia did under the law on missing persons is quite interesting. And I think Colombia did the same, other countries in Latin America did the same as there's a, a certificate of absence so that a person doesn't have to say that uh, the family member is yeah. dead or alive, they're just absent so that rights can be claimed. And this is extremely important also to having custody and having inheritance so that your life can go on. So even though there's mental trauma, it's very important again that the state takes responsibility for these cases um, and you know applies reparations you know in line with universal principles, but also conducts investigations and also secures other rights, including justice and truth. So I, this sounds so obvious, but it never right, very right. rarely happens. Oh, no, this is this is why you're you're talking it. You're speaking at the hair minutes. And you're going to be too, teaching so. us at your university. Right, <laughs> right, right. So we're, we're giving you the platform. Uh, there's a, there's a, a two-part question. How much do you think the immigration policy in the EU, EU-wide policy, and the policy of individual countries is affecting the approach to missing migrants? I mean, it is 27 countries. Um, they're challenged in many different ways right now. They they're challenged in trying to basically vaccinate the EU bloc in Europe. Uh, and now the issue of just thousands and thousands of migrants coming to, to Europe from North Africa. Um, and this is a, a, an issue that we've been seeing in, in the Balkans for quite some time, the last at least five to six years where migrants are coming through Balkan routes, attempting to get into uh, the Schengen zone. And um, I kind of, I'm just going to say it, I kind of feel the EU uses the Balkans as a way to prevent them from getting into the Schengen zone. But I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on- Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that the current climate of populism, nationalism um, results in discrimination. And I, I genuinely think that is a factor when we're looking at the issue of dead and missing migrants um, and why there's such a high number. So, I mean, that, that's definitely a factor. Uh, but, but also related to that is there genuinely isn't the institutional capacity, as I said earlier, not because, I mean, Europe, of course, is, these are very wealthy countries. That's not the issue. Or even in the United States, just Biden creating this task force is a step in the right direction. So the institutional capacity has to exist. There has to be an understanding that these cases need to be solved in line with you know, rule of law and democratic principles, because if they're not resolved, we actually undermine our democracies. Um, we undermine the rule of law. We undermine the principles that we uphold. Uh, so it's, it's critical for a variety of reasons, but I think politically it's difficult now. So you know, an organization like ICMP can help states, all states um, alleviate that burden, but these practical measures can be cost-effective. I mean, they don't need to be expensive. So there, there are measures that can be undertaken. I just don't think it's been that carefully thought through, but it really needs to be. And, and in fact, the presentation I'm giving you today, I'm gonna to give um, to, to EU countries, to other countries. Uh, there are practical solutions, there are, they are cost-effective and they, I see them as an investment in peace and stability because not doing this exactly. will exacerbate right. the political problem. So we have a, another comment and question uh, with regard to accountability of investigations. Um, he, this person is pointing out that there's a recent example of discovered artifacts in a small city in Bosnia was assigned to a lead investigator who is Serbian, who's based in Sarajevo and was in the military and police during the war. This fax makes it a bit worrisome in feeling confident in his fidelity to the mission. Of course, I hope that's not the reality. Again, the key point here is accountability. Uh, however, how should investigators, how are they being vetted is a concern. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really aware of this case. I mean, the, the mechanisms that are in place are, okay, they have worked, but it's shaky. 
you know, like everything else in, in, in the Western Balkans at this point, I think there's a lot of continuing uh, undermining of, of uh, state responsibility of, of dealing with these difficult issues. But nevertheless, um, I think what we've seen is that these investigations continue, uh, that you know, the prosecutors are trying to do their jobs, the commissions or missing persons institutions are trying to do their jobs. But you know, there it is not easy. I mean, there is political bullying, badgering coming from multiple sides. I've seen this. Uh, there has been, you know, a, a, they've been. I mean, a lot of these institutions have been stripped of their financial resources to carry out their work. Uh, in Bosnia, there still is no one state level forensic institute, for example, uh, which is a concern because they're, you know, the missing right. persons institute, the prosecutor's office need to work hand in hand. Um, but I think this political toing and froing has has unfortunately um, haunted this whole issue for a long time. And I think these are the questions that we need to ask going forward. The majority of missing have now been found. It's being it's harder since 2009 to find the remaining cases. So ensuring that these institutions work is something that civil society must continue to do. Um, so I, I'm not aware of a particular case. Yeah, but. well, yes. So let me just um, also just mention, because there is a question about how can states uh, ask for ICMP help, and you just mentioned that you're going to be presenting this to some EU countries, and that's part of your mandate, is it not, to advise states and work with states uh, to help them set up accountability mechanisms? Yeah, no, exactly. And we've helped um, multiple states. Uh, I mean, around the world, we've worked in 40 countries, but we also helped the United States, for example, following Hurricane Katrina um, during a time of need. We, as I said earlier, we hope uh, to provide support to the Biden task force. If we're you know, requested to or invited to, we would be happy uh, to help. So we've helped with World War II cases in, in Norway. I mean, beyond, we, we are currently helping also with the MH17 cases, which is the largest investigation into Dutch. Oh, the um, Dutch the, oh you're history. working on that case. Wow. Yeah, so there are two remaining passengers that have not been identified. identified. And again, these are emblematic issues uh, that, um, you know, are, but, you know, we can talk for hours about this. But sure. Working with states, building their capacity is key. Mm -hmm. There's a, another question about uh, what about Cyprus and the thousands of missing Greek Cypriots slain by the Turkish invasion and occupation troops, but also the recently found mass graves by the UN. Any update on uh, the reparation yeah. issues there? Yeah, so... I, <laughs> Just if I'm, I'm going to get to Cyprus in one second, but if you sure. if you look at conflicts that took place before the 1990s, where Cyprus, Lebanon, right. Argentina, a lot of right. time before the world, I mean, the world really changed in the 1990s with the creation of these courts in in The Hague yes. uh, and the desire to hold perpetrators to account. The Cyprus model is an older model um, where uh, you have uh, the two, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the uh, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots coming together under the banner of the UN. Um, you know, the Greek Cypriots are one party, the Turkish Cypriots are another, and the UN is the third party um, or the third member of the Committee on Missing Persons. Um, and, and this is more of a humanitarian structure, I would say. Uh, where um, accountability and investigations are not part of the remit of this particular committee. Um, and this has been studied, and I'm, I'm very happy to share with the individual who's asked this question, uh, a doc, I mean, the, the, the rulings uh, coming out of Strasbourg uh, regarding that particular case um, and the desire and need under the law to ensure investigation. So, I think Cyprus is a longer discussion. We did also help with um, DNA-based identifications in the context of Cyprus as well. Uh, so there's a longer discussion here, but quite a number of people, I mean, I think it's approximately 3,000 persons went missing and about half of those cases have been resolved so far. Um, there's a question about, about DNA samples that are taken I think for migrants that have died while attempting to cross uh, 
I'm not sure if we're talking about ocean here or not, but problems with cemetery procedure. Uh, and there are there's a lack of maps, markers, and mass graves. How will this affect identification and repatriation in the future? Finding missing migrants um, will be a very complicated um, job, but I think it's possible. I mean, you know, I still remember, you know, I've been working on this issue now for almost uh, 25 years. I mean, when we first started working in the Western Balkans, they said it was impossible. I mean, they, I mean, everyone felt it was impossible to find uh, those missing from the Srebrenica genocide. So having been through this uh, process and having helped the states account for such a high number, I always feel optimistic that this can be done. There are ways. It will be complicated, but it will require number one, cooperation between um, states that have the bodies of the missing migrants, um, instituting a central record between them and conducting an outreach campaign um, for migrant families uh, to voluntarily provide data uh, and eventually maybe even genetic data. Um, this could be complicated again, uh, because the, uh, in many cases, the, the countries of origin are not one in which the families may be comfortable in providing data. What does give me hope, though, is the advances in forensic genetics. Um, and currently, in the Western Balkans, for example, we applied uh, nuclear DNA technology or short tandem repeat. Um, ICMP is now working on using next generation sequencing or massively parallel sequencing um, which would allow you to make direct matches between individuals farther down the hereditary line. Uh, you will also be able to tell, let's say, for example, Italy has uh, a dead migrant in its custody uh, with MPS technology, taking a postmortem sample and deriving a DNA uh, profile from it, you would be able to tell where this uh, person is coming from. Are they coming from Sub-Saharan Africa or are they coming from Afghanistan? which would then allow you in turn to reach out to areas in the world that these migrants are coming from to be able to make matches. So these things are within the realm of possibility and science is advancing quickly, um, but we seem to still be stuck <laughs> in a political abyss at the moment. Uh, so applying these new technologies would be possible. It's just the world has to be ready for it. Um, yes, these, these um, DNA advances are really remarkable. Uh, you, were, you and I were discussing that earlier. Um, there's a question about um, state, I think state responsibility. Um, I'm going to read it to you. How does attribution of responsibility transfer when new states are formed and the older culprit state state is dismantled, how can uh, there be an avoidance of absolution through state redefinition? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really excellent question. And maybe we could use Syria as a model. And, and one document I haven't shared with Tanya, um, but if you, again, give me your, your email address, I'd be happy to do so. We did an analysis of the current legal um, uh, landscape within Syria and the institutional landscape within Syria. Um, and of course, you know, many of these laws were created in the 1950s um, and Velma and others from the Western Balkans will also remember this. I mean, we had to start fresh. I mean, creating new legislation such as the law on missing persons, creating new institutions across the region, including the Missing Persons Institute. So, and effectively, that's also what we're doing now in the context of Libya, where we did an assessment on the situation in Libya. So if one looks at the institutional legislative landscape um, and then tries to build capacities um, in that context. Uh, and pretty much, I think we know what to do now in terms of how to help states build that capacity. So it is possible, but it would take political will. And, and this is what worries me in the context of Syria is would Syria, a future Syria, uh, be capable of creating a commission or institution that would search for all Syrians, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or national origin? Would they be capable or willing to create legislation that secures the rights of all surviving families of the missing? So it took 10 years in Bosnia to create the Missing Persons Institute. It takes time. Uh, but eventually, hopefully, it can happen. But we have examples where 
you know, again, that give me optimism, but it's not easy. Uh, this is going to be our last question, uh, Catherine. Um, it, this is related to the previous uh, question on DNA. In addition to those new technologies, how useful would isotopic analysis be? Um, somewhat, but not in terms of identification uh, directly. So when we're talking about using STR technologies and um, MPS technologies, we, we really are looking at forensic genetics and looking at genetic markers um, so that we can identify uh, missing persons. I mean, ICMP maintains the only dedicated high throughput DNA laboratory in the world that's dedicated to human identification. Um, and the advances in the human genome and understanding the human genome have really advanced the use of this science. It's very, very hugely exciting uh, to use new scientific methods, which we're trying to do right now with Vietnam. Vietnam is interested, for example, in identifying um, Vietnamese missing from the Vietnam War. Um, it's a very young population, so we're really looking at matching, uh, doing kinship matching between uh, people that are possibly the great grandparents <laughs> of those that are alive today. So we're, we're really looking at uh, nuclear DNA um, and looking at advances that allow for identity testing or kinship matching. I wanna thank our audience. They were very engaged and asked a lot of very, uh, very good questions, which I'm not surprised about. Um, Catherine, I just wanna commend you and your, your staff the work you are doing is so important. I want to repeat what you said. You believe that establishing these mechanisms is a way to help establish peace. And that's really what I think a, a lot of us really care about having worked in so many um, countries post-conflict um, and knowing the just absolute terror of war and what, what happens to communities and whole states. Um, you've really contributed in such a significant way. And I really appreciate you accepting our invitation because this is a human rights issue established under international laws. And I will add a section in my human rights class uh, in the fall about this and use your, your um, PowerPoint and maybe even draft you to speak to my class. So. Um, there, there are lots of messages here. I hope your staff picked them up because some people want to want to have an exchange with you about certain issues. Um, you have a standing invitation. If you're in New York, please, and when this pandemic is over and it will come to an end, uh, to come back to the Harriman Institute and share the current work of the ICMP. Thank you so very much. It's been an honor and pleasure. Thank you, Tom.